Hello and welcome to Books Without Barcodes, where I review books published before April 1978 because that is when all publications were required to have UPC codes. This particular book that I'll be reviewing today is Robert Silverberg's To Open the Sky. This is a first edition paperback by Ballantine Books and this was published May 1967. And that's a little bit important, but I'll get into that later. Uh, a little bit of information about the author, Robert Silverberg, is that he was born in 1935 and is still with us as of October 2021, which hasn't been the case with most of my Books Without Barcodes authors. He uh, graduated college in 1956 with a literary degree and has been writing novels ever since. He is considered one of the best science fiction writers of all time and is in the Science Fiction Hall of Fame. In addition uh, to that, there was a brief period in time from 1959 until the mid-60s in which he wrote softcore porn. And I say that only if that's something you're interested in seeking out. It's basically just erotic fiction. Uh, it's not actually like video quality. I don't know why I felt the need to include that, but I did because I found that very interesting when I learned it for myself. And also maybe you can find some titles for yourself if that's the kind of literature that you're interested in reading. Now to open the sky, uh, this book is broken up into five novellas. The first four novellas introduce the main reoccurring characters. They give like an origin story for each book. So they'll introduce one or two main characters and then give the origin story. That is what the purpose of that novella is for, which culminate into the grand finale and the end where there's an intersection of all of the characters, including the most main character, which is Noel Vorst, which you only hear about until the final chapters. Now, Noel Vorst in this book has founded a religion called Foresters. Um, it is a secular religion based on the Adam where you worship science instead of a religious figure. And their, their premise is to promise everlasting life in the actual sense and not just in an afterlife or a spiritual sense. Like they are actually promising through worship and through tithing that they will be able to research and come up with a way for humanity to live forever, um, which I find interesting. And in addition, their second promise is to expand humanity's reach. So not just on earth, but to allow humans to grow and reach all aspects of the universe. And those are the two the two main purposes of this religion is to actually make those things happen for their worshipers. The uh, first book was quite an interesting introduction, or I should say the first novella was quite an interesting introduction into this, into, into this world that he has built. Um, just a little bit more about the novellas. Book one takes place in 2077. Book two takes place in the year 2095. Book three takes place in 2135. Book four takes place in 2152. And then the final book takes place in 2164. So in the first book in 2077, Silverberg, uh, I believe rightly surmises that humanity has uh, overpopulated Earth. He His guesstimate was 10 billion people by the year 2077, and that is after humanity has started to colonize their neighboring planets, Venus and Mars. So they've sent off several million people to there to colonize, and in 2077, those are supposed to be in the second generation of colonizers which I don't think that is going to be a correct assumption, but we are approaching 8 billion people. So 10 billion people by that time period might've been a conservative measure, but in this society that he's created, humans have started to control the population by 
trying to get their birth rate closer or less than the death rate worldwide, globally. It's an effort, which I find a nice thought <laughs> that all of the countries of the world could actually agree on one thing. <laughs> it's interesting that that would be the one thing. So the way that they have colonized the two planets, which I also found very interesting, is Mars has been terraformed, which to be honest, valid. In order to colonize Venus, humans have been genetically altered and surgically altered in order to sustain life on Venus. Now, I really very much enjoyed that because it did look like Silverberg. I like it when there's actual science in these science fiction books. Venus, if you're interested in space at all, uh, actually has quite a dense uh, atmosphere. Um, however, it, and it is mostly comprised of CO2 um, and nitrogen and sulfuric acid. So the humans are being surgically altered in order to have like gill-like structures that are actually just an intense filtering system in order to make the body be able to breathe such a dense atmosphere that is uh, nutriently and elementally different than Earth's atmosphere, whereas Mars, they just made Mars another Earth. The thing that I had an issue with when you get into the science is that uh, Venus, again, super dense, super hot, like, you know, <laughs> it's, it's the same pressure as like being 900 feet underwater. And in addition to that it's hot like hundreds of fahrenheit degree hot not just like 120 you know or 141 which you can get here in like the the hottest parts of the desert but like hundreds of degrees fahrenheit hot and the way that he described changing humans in addition to what i felt was clever which is a filtering guild system they made these people like eight feet tall and blue that might have just been artistic license, to be fair, but um, I guess if you look at it in that the deeper you go in the ocean where there's more pressure, the larger the animals are. Never mind. I changed. Now that I've thought about it, never mind. <laughs> Having a realization there's like, no, if you think about the oceans and you have like, you know, the giant squid and the larger, like, the more pressure there is, it seems to be the larger the life, but then there's also the light thing, but the light's not an issue because of the fact that Venus is the second closest planet to the sun. This is how my brain works. This is our, This is why I very much enjoyed this book is because it made me think about stuff very hard <laughs> or in a way that I hadn't really thought about it before. Uh, but back to book one, uh, book one introduced us to Reynolds Kirby's and Nathaniel Wiener, which I feel like Silverberg had Nathan's hot dogs for lunch one day and was like, you know what, that's what I'm going to name my Martian character. And I will say that I have to read this sentence to you all because this is one of the first sentences you read in the second chapter of the first book. And I had to put the book down for a solid five minutes because my inner child was losing its mind, laughing so hard. He yearned to shake Wiener off and crawl back into the nothing chamber to get all this poison out of his system. There is so much innuendo in that one sentence, I just could not handle it and it's, it makes me giggle even reading it now. Uh, going back again to the making you think about things. So this talks about a nothing chamber, which is where you can suspend yourself via a breathing tube in this fluid and it like shuts out all sound and extra light and everything and you're just kind of like going back into the womb so to speak and the way they described it it kind of made me think about the how daredevil sleeps in that totally not terrible movie with ben affleck in it and that, that, that's the kind of mental image that I had or something similar to the Minority Report with the, uh, is it the Minority Report where they have the psychics suspended to like 
I think it's the Minority Report. Anyway, those kind of things, I thought that was really cool. Uh, also sounded very awesome. I would totally be down for a couple hours in a nothing chamber. Just in general, I feel like that would be awesome for me. I feel like that most people would be totally cool with checking out of everything for an hour. But I really like that. Uh, also in book one, it introduced uh, cosmetic surgery. A very interesting take on uh, cosmetic surgery and thinking about it. And if you take an understanding from the time period that was written in the 60s when cosmetic surgery started to be something that was prevalent. It started to be more accepted, more common among, among the affluent uh, and influential people. And it talks about how dated that can make you seem because it's a permanent change to your body. Whereas instead of changing your body surgically in order to prolong your life, for example, getting a heart transplant or a kidney transplant or something like that, which they talk about as one of the ways that they extend the Vorster's extended life is through organ transplant and radiation to keep you from rejecting newly grown organs. And it's talking about there was a period in time in this book where cosmetic procedures were extreme. It wasn't or what can be deigned by our standards as extreme. Where it could be instead of, you know, doing a, a, a facelift, right? To uh, make everything tighter. They were actually like cutting off your eyelids and replacing it with a foil curtain and how that was all the rage. So you saw all these women, like middle-aged women with foil eyelids because that was in vogue for like a brief period of time. And then now all these women look dated and that's like something that they have common in here. Uh, and the, it made me think a little bit about how many women currently who are like millennial or Gen X women are getting their eyebrows microbladed because they overplucked their eyebrows to fit into our early 2000, late 90s uh, beauty standards. So I just thought that was interesting and made me think about it, how transient beauty standards, how some people will go to great lengths in order to maintain beauty standards in a society and then it becomes dated later on. It also was reminiscent of of Susan Collins' Hunger Games, like how District 1 and District 2 change themselves cosmetically and frequently in order to keep up with whatever raging trend there was at that time. Um, but those seemed a little bit less permanent and uh, easier to change in their society versus the ones that were done in, in this novel were not. They seemed to be more permanent, like you couldn't go back. Once you, once you fi fix something inorganic to yourself, that was it. You couldn't go back to an organic way beforehand, which I thought that was interesting. So in, in book one, we, we meet, uh, we meet our first Martian, which is a delegate <laughs> to earth. Uh, and Reynolds Kirby is a UN ambassador that has to show the Martian a good time. Uh, so you get kind of like how the world is, what the current structure is, what are the current Thing. like you 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 get an introduction to the Vorister religion which I've explained already earlier uh in book two you get like at the inner workings of the Vorister religion uh and how their hierarchy within the religion works and you also get introduced to a subversive faction within the Vorister set called the Harmonists and they have taken, instead of a secular religious approach, to make uh, more iconography and actually make Noel, Noel Vorst like kind of a religious symbol. Uh, and they also have their own prophet, who is David Lazarus. Another interesting part of this book is a subset of humans called espers they're called espers and these are individuals that are born with otherworldly abilities or extra abilities so people who have precognition are empathetic more than just you know the I'm an empath kind of empathetic but like 
actually empathetic <laughs> or people that are able to uh, time travel people who can read minds to people who could alter people's memories or their minds and, and what they do in this book or the foresters do in this book is in addition to utilizing espers in order to maintain power within their organization on earth they are also trying to genetically they make a colony of these people within a certain area in the United States where they are supposed to enter breed with each other in order to create super espers <laughs> a selective genetic breeding of this set of humans and it's talked about in a way that's very other human like it's very much like you can tell that the tonality of the way that people are talking about espers is that they are subhuman even though they are other human if if that makes sense like they don't view them with the same respect or personhood as as regular people because they have these other abilities that are considered invasive to regular people they're kind of treated throughout most of the books as useful pariahs and the way that they talk about the selective re breeding of the foresters very icky <laughs> very icky but also like very realistic uh, again, this was taking place in the 60s when, you know, forced sterilization of disabled people was still totally cool, totally valid way to deal with that. If you didn't know that, that's something that's been going on from pretty much seven tenths of the 20th century, if you didn't know that. Uh, and in fact, the sterilization program, uh, some of the aspects of Mein Kampf by Hitler is, is thought to have been inspired as well as some of the, the Nazi projects by uh, the sterilization techniques uh, and totally okay and, and asylum practices within the United States are inspired by that within the United States. If I made you uncomfortable, good, because reading this part also made me uncomfortable because <laughs> it's not okay. But I, I did find the results of the espers interesting and the variations and how generationally they became stronger to the point where they would burn out and it's basically the power would become so much and overwhelm the body the the mental ability would overwhelm the body to the point where it would just fail um which you know burnout is a real thing like Real burnout is a real thing. You know, how many people are being overworked uh, that are actually dying from being overworked or from stress around the world currently? So I thought that that was very interesting and I didn't want to gloss over that. It, it just, it made me feel a little bit icky reading that in addition to uh, the derogatory and subset language that was used in the book with racist undertones because oh, some of the espers were not white uh, and as someone who is both disabled and not white I know I look white <laughs> they, they used one uh, derogatory Asian term I did not like so there's that and it also seemed to be more prevalent among espers being women than men which I found interesting so the reason why they were selectively breeding the espers is because of the fact that in addition to doing genetic research in order to prolong normal human life, they were also trying to see if selective breeding, they could make these powers stronger and or have new variations or mutations within the esper community that would be useful to interplanetary exploration. So you know something like with x-men the the mutants there uh, nightcrawler and his ability to teleport uh or you know that kind of thing and i found that very interesting again also a little icky just because they did kind of well they didn't 
corral all espers into this grouping of people there was definitely basically an internment camp in the united states pretty much where the japanese internment camps were <laughs> kind of and uh just forced to live in this society and breed amongst themselves in order to make superhumans that could hopefully teleport regular humans uh, across the space which again interesting thought still made me feel kind of icky and then in book three you get an amazing look at venus and how humans are genetically altered in order to survive on venus and then like it's just really cool and then the fourth book you get an introduction a little bit of introduction to Ma uh, martian society and then of course there's the grand finale which i will not share with you because that would spoil the book but it does contain noel vorst because again Voristers are trying to prolong life so all of these people that you get introduced to in 2077 are still alive in the final book in 2164 so I think it's very I think I enjoyed this book immensely just because it made me think about things uh, like I talked about about you know beauty standards and changing I really liked some of the science that went into this I thought that was very pertinent considering you know this book is published in 1967 first scans of uh, Venus was uh, 1962 the first scans of Mars was 1965 so yeah those totally seemed like two planets that you could colonize especially considering that Venus is um, a dizygotic twin to Earth or scientists considered it a, a dizygotic twin to Earth where they believed that Venus was very much like earth in the very beginning but vastly declined due to some unknown reason um, into its lava oceans and volcanoes that it is now but what i found as a final note very interesting is that despite the fact that silverberg wrote the colonization of venus and mars and that they were successful for completely different reasons there is no mention of the moon none out of all the planetary bodies that are close to us, I understand that Venus is the closest planet and Mars is the one that's most likely that we can make into an Earth-like planet. Did did we just give up on the moon? I don't <laughs> I don't understand. I don't know if maybe because of the the wars, the space wars, the Cold War space wars uh, between us and the USSR during that time and everybody was trying to get to the moon if he felt like maybe if he wrote the moon into this colonization structure that it would date the book too much I, I don't know I don't know Robert Silverberg and I don't think he'll ever watch this video but you know Robert Silverberg if you ever uh, watch this video if you could tell me why humans did not colonize the moon in this book I would really like to know that why you decided to just leave that out altogether but I, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, I, I do read and release these, so I will be listing this on my eBay store. Link will be down below. One of you guys can snag this. It's going to be about $4 plus shipping. I also really like the cover. I mean, the cover is really... <laughs> I like that it's it's just like a, a person and a, a, an atom. You don't know what gender this person is. It's just an interesting abstract cover. But yeah, I enjoyed reading this book. I do recommend it. I do like the science in it. I do like the way it made me think. And hopefully you will as well. So thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!